is where you would like the permissions to fail, actually, <laughs> not work. OK, like when, I, when I first started talking about this in 2009 or so, actually even earlier, 2008, uh, multi-cores were m mostly symmetric, except for the cell processor, IBM cell processor, which had uh, basically eight uh, processing elements, uh, synergistic processing elements, I believe, and one primary processing element. The primary processing element was a control processor, and synergistic processing elements were kind of like SIMD units. Uh, multiple uh, processors, eight processors that had wide SIMD units. And this was asymmetric for them. Except with one caveat, the uh, primary pr uh, synergistic processing elements were actually much more powerful than this control processor. The control processor was good at sequential code a little bit, but it's, it wasn't that much powerful. It was still in order execution engine. But now, I think a lot of the industry is moving towards us. You know probably about ARM's big and little architecture, right? Big dot little. Big is written in small letters, and little is written in capital letters because you have many little and only one big. Well, many is three today, but it's going to increase going forward. Today, so going forward, uh, a lot of the systems will be asymmetric. And hopefully in this lecture, you'll figure out why that is the case. Uh, because you cannot get the best of both worlds. You actually, you know that. This is heterogeneity. Right? Asymmetry and heterogeneity are the same thing. If you want to get the best of both worlds, heterogeneity is a good design choice that you would like to make in general. OK, uh, lab seven. <laughs> I know this is causing some trouble to many of Some of you, <laughs> some of you are really excited about it. So we'll talk about it. Basically, this is due uh, May 2nd. Uh, last submission is except on May 9th. Basically, we're granting you a seven-day extension. You don't have to work on it after May 2nd. But if you wish, you can. So you, you're, you're certainly welcome to submit it on May 2nd. Uh, this is an important part of your education, I think. That's why I would like to keep the lab seven. And uh, that's, this is what I said in the last lecture, basically. No other late days are accepted. Basically, your other late days will be turned into cookies, which are here. <laughs> and we'll have heterogeneity in the cookies also. I didn't, I didn't get you a homogeneous collection. So if you actually like healthier cookies, there are healthier cookies. If you like salty cookies, I guess crackers, there are salty ones. I think this is Rachada's favorite. So make sure you live one, leave one for him. If you like Chips Ahoy, which I used to like, <laughs> there's that also. But <laughs> well, we're going to trade that later. But I would like you to do the lab. <laughs> and uh, well, before I give you the news about the lab, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, we provide a reference simulator to aid you. I, I saw a lot of uh, uh, demands for the reference simulator. We really don't need to provide that to you. It's really an aid for you to, uh, uh, to uh, design your simula uh, simula simulator to meet the specifications. Okay? In real life, there are no reference simulators. If you're designing a system from the beginning, think about the real life. right? You're, you don't really have a reference simulator for the MESI coherence protocol that you are thinking of designing. right? unless somebody happened to write that reference simulator early, unless you're Intel and you have a tradition of actually writing simulators for 20 years, then you have that reference simulator. But if you're going to change your microarchitecture, that reference simulator still doesn't match your new microarchitecture, right? Tough luck. You'll need to write that reference simulator, and you'll need to verify it. And you will get errors. I mean, even Intel simulators don't necessarily match their hardware today, because that's how it is. You cannot model everything perfectly. That's why we have the slacking grading that says if you match within 10%, we're going to assume that. Actually, it depends on the lab, but I believe it's 10% for this lab, right? Right, Shada? Yes. yes. So if you match the cycle counts within 10%, you get the full grade. So this is really we're, we're, what we're doing is we're mod, uh, modeling real life. In real life, you don't really have reference simulators for a new microarchitecture that you're designing. This is what I would like to impress upon you, because when you go out into the industry, for example, if you do go out into the industry, that's what you will have to deal with, unfortunately. You may, you may get a validation job, in fact, and your job could be validating uh, the new simulator that someone, has, someone else has written for a new microarchitecture uh, compared to the old simulator for some other microarchitecture. And what you're doing in that job is actually there's this old microarchitecture, let's say five-stage pipeline, and there's this new microarchitecture, that's, let's say six-stage pipeline. You're trying to cross-validate 
the simulators and understand actually if the new simulator is behaving consistently with the old simulator. And sometimes it may, this may require matching exactly the new simulator to the old simulator such that you start from the same base. Right? So real life is unfortunately complicated. <laughs> And I know people who have actually spent their, spent their careers doing this validation. Like they spent 30 years doing the simulator validation. And they, get, they become really, really good at it. So if, they, if you give them a simulator, they can tell you, here, you made a mistake over there. <laughs> so basically, uh, what we're doing is we're really preparing you for, you for the uh, real life. But we're helping you with the reference simulator. But do not expect it to be given and do not rely on it too much. Uh, because in the real life, you won't be given. Even if you were given, question it. Because there might be some mistakes in the reference simulator also. And we've seen that happen many, many times. Even there are mistakes in real hardware too, right? If you look at the errata sheets uh, of Intel, you will see that there are errors in real processors. And I would, I would suggest that you take a look at them. If you look at them, you'll see that a lot of the errors are actually in the coherence protocol. They say if the, they, they don't tell you exactly how to exercise the errors, but otherwise, People will be exercising the bugs, obviously. But uh, they tell you, if these conditions somehow happen, maybe the system will hang. Right. <laughs> so these bugs escape. So even the real processors are not correct. So simulators are probably less correct. But anyway, uh, the architect designs a reference simulator. And what I'd like you to take away from this course is the design of that reference simulator. That's what will enable you to become better architects. And the architect verifies it. The architect tests it. The architect fixes it, and the architect makes sure that there, is no there are no bugs. <laughs> now you get help from the validators, uh, but they usually do it after you have some reference simulators. Right? That's the job of the architect. So everything you're doing in this class is really the job of the architect in a real industry setting. OK? This is what I would like to really impress upon you. Even though we give you a reference simulators, that's for your eight. But that's, uh, well, I guess there's the other thing. The architect also ensures the simulator matches the specification. And this is an iterative process. All of this needs to be done while you're designing the simulator. And you may change the specification also as an architect. That's what you're not allowed to do in this course. We give you the specification, unfortunately. Otherwise, there's no way to grade, right? But if you're the architect at Intel or AMD or NVIDIA or Qualcomm or one of those companies, ARM, this is what you do, basically, with the, sim with the uh, performance models. OK? So that's why I would like to do, uh, you to do this for the MESI protocol in the Lab 7.2. But I'd li like to help you a little bit also. Basically, I'll, change, I'll do some changes to the grading to encourage you to do the lab, uh, but also to reward people who do the lab well. OK? Uh, one of the suggestions was to make the entire lab extra credit. I actually thought about it, but I think that would be unfair to people who have already started the lab and who've done, who made significant progress. So this is what we'll do. Like every lab, lab seven is worth 5% of your entire course grade. My gift will be 3% of this. <laughs> so everybody gets 3%. You don't need to submit the lab. You can just relax. 3%. Is that good? I, I, I assume everyone will take that gift, right? So you lose only 2% if you don't do the lab at all. OK? 2% of this 5%, you can earn by getting a grade between 0 and 40 out of 100, if you submit the lab, of course. And if you get 40 out of 100, if you pass our tests and get 40, then you'll get 2%. You'll get the full grade of the lab, which is not bad, right? <laughs> and if you actually uh, get something between 40 and 100, you'll get an additional 3% extra credit weighted by whatever you get over here. Okay, so you can you can get significant extra credit by getting the lab fully correct. Yes. Is there any difference between getting forty and hundred? Is there uh, getting forty and hundred? Oh yeah, that's. that's uh, will we get like you know like will we get three percent regardless of whether we get forty or hundred? No. So if you get forty, uh, so this will be no, weighted. This will. Right? Oh, if you got sixty, what you will have is basically you got the two percent. Uh, basically, your three additional three percent will be weighted over here. Does that make sense? Basically, you can think of it this way also. You, you get 3% regardless, and then the remaining 5% you get will be weighted by your grade. Okay? So if you got 60, you'll get 
uh, a total of 6% of your entire grade. Make sense? It seems like you're basically giving us 3% yes. and nothing else changes. You could think of it that way, except it's extra credit. <laughs> so you're getting extra credit. <laughs> But you're, I mean, whether you call the 3% gift extra credit or the additional 3% extra credit, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, I guess, in terms of how we think about it, that because it's extra credit, fewer people will do it. Uh -huh. But yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> numerically, it's no, no, numerically, it's not the same because this is, uh, all, uh, this is your course grade. This will be your course grade. And this additional will be beyond the course grade. right? So here's an opportunity to get beyond the course grade. Well, so if you've actually messed up a, an earlier assignment in the, in the past, yeah. You can you can make up for it. Does the, would this extra credit factor into the curve of the class? No, so that's 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 what extra credit is actually. This will help you. This will help you bump up your grade. Okay. So that's the difference. Right. So you can bump up your grade by actually doing this extra. That's true for all extra credits actually. Okay. Yes. Extra credit don't affect curves. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what. That's the same thing. So that's why this is different. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Basically, you will get the full grade if you get forty percent on the slab. That's it. You can think of it that way. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I think this is super fair and awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, just a quick question, though. Like, how do you know what grade you're like? Is a forty like what's a forty? Oh, what's a forty? That's based on the tests that we run. Okay. Here. And we'll we'll release some tests. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's like every other lab. If you get. Like some of the tests, you'll get maybe some pr fraction of the grade. Okay. So I definitely encourage you to get it at least working to some extent, at least the simple cases. That way, you get the full grade of the lab relatively easily. And if you get it working more, then you'll get extra credit, which will help you even more. Besides, if you don't care about all of this, which is good, <laughs> then you will learn a lot. <laughs> okay. Basically, you can think of it this way also: effect on total course grade including the extra credit is this one, basically. You'll get 3%. That's regardless of whether you submit. And when you submit, you'll get a grade. And that will be weighted by 100. And then that'll be multiplied by 5%. OK. OK. You can read that. <laughs> is that fair? Yes. Everyone's happy with it? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> no? <laughs> OK, good. So that, that hopefully doesn't penalize people who have done the lab, who want to do more. and helps other people who are feeling the time pressure. <laughs> OK, well, talking about time pressure, there is a final exam that's coming up we've already talked about. <laughs> and we've already talked about this, but we, we may cover it again later. And this is also 25% of your grade, so think about this. And I will take into account your improvement over the course. That's, there's no question about that. Well, I've, I've talked about this before. If you're interested in 742, if you're really excited about this stuff, I would encourage you to take 742 also, because it'll be a deep dive into many topics we covered. And you don't need to have taken 640 and 740, because 742, if you've taken this course with me, you'll be prepared for 742. And if you're interested in computer architecture research or a job or internship in this area, I'd be happy to help too. Course evaluations, don't forget that too, lots of deadlines. These are due May 12, and you probably know, you probably get emails about this all the time. Your feedback is very important to me. But it shouldn't be just, uh, <coughs> this course is hard. <laughs> you knew that from the beginning, right? And I knew that also. And I told you that, actually. I was <laughs> so give me more feedback than just, this course is hard. And I read this very carefully and take into account every piece of feedback. Obviously, I will not be able to address, because there are lots of conflicting pieces of feedback also. right? Some people really like this thing. Some other people really hate this thing. And that's kind of the nature of this course. That's why we'll, need to, we'll try to have heterogeneity. So that's why we try to adjust some of these grading schemes such that they're heterogeneous, right? They're not homogeneous. That's the subject of this lecture, heterogeneity. OK. I think I'll cover this again. Yeah, don't just say the course is hard because you knew that from the very beginning. <laughs> Give me more detailed feedback. OK, last lecture. We'll get to, I think, uh, the cookies later on, unless somebody's really, really hungry here. No? OK. Well, we'll distribute the exams, too. But last lecture, we covered, uh, we wrapped up cache coherence, and we talked about interconnects. These are all important topics. Interconnects we did not really do justice to. Interconnects are everywhere uh, in the world. Uh, roads are interconnects also. Uh, and 
packets that are routed on the roads are cars and maybe pedestrians sometimes. Uh, but we didn't do justice because we covered it in only one lecture. But if you take 742, we'll do a lot more justice to it. Maybe we should do this in the break. Rachada, maybe you can send out the cookie sheet somewhere or post it online such that everybody knows how many cookies they will get or they will give me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you this, that one here. This is the cookie sheet, basically. So some people get zero cookies, some people get seven. <laughs> some people owe me cookies. <laughs> I guess on, on, uh, overall, I owe you a total of 91 cookies. <laughs> Say it again. Neg negative means you owe me cookies. <laughs> and I see a negative four over here, negative three, negative two. I guess zero, we don't need to exchange anything. <laughs> so Rachara will post this and then <laughs> you can get it in the break. <laughs> OK? I would like my cookies. <laughs> That's OK. You can take from here and then give it to me, and that'll work too, probably. <laughs> OK. So today, we'll talk about the evolution of multi-core systems uh, handling serial and parallel bottlenecks better, which will lead us to heterogeneous multi-core systems. And when I say heterogeneous multi-core, it's the same as asymmetric multi-core. These are the same things, asymmetry, heterogeneity. Uh, so if you look at multi-cores, and this is an old picture, uh, we've talked about the motivation for this, motivation for parallel computing. You get simpler and lower power core than a single large core. And then you can put them. You can replicate them, just like you see in some of these. Well, so this is cell, actually, what we've talked about before. You get large-scale parallelism on chip. And most of the industry is multi-core today. Actually, I don't, I don't know if you can buy a single-core chip, except for very simple microcontrollers today. So with many cores on chip, what we want is n times the performance with n times the cores when we parallelize an application on n cores. Right? But that's not what we get. We've talked about. Uh, it's many times. What we get is really Amdahl's law. You get a serial bottleneck and bottlenecks in the parallel portion, and there were three of them. I'll, give, I'll, I'll increase your cookie count if you tell me each of those. What are the three bottlenecks in the parallel portion? Resource contention, one cookie over here. Load there. imbalance. Load imbalance. <laughs> All right, you got two cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Rachada, you're updating this, right? <laughs> <laughs> just just tell, tell, tell us when, we, when you need it. But those are the bottlenecks. Yeah, resource condensation, synchronization, and load imbalance. Uh, and this is Amdahl's law. We've seen it. And I'm not going to go over this very quickly, because you've seen this many times. So uh, the problem is really serialized code sections. And actually, all of these lead to serialization. But let's take a look at Amdahl's law first. This is the real serial portion. Here. When you need to synchronize, when multiple threads are waiting for a lock, for example, you're really serializing threads. If all threads are waiting for a lock, except for one, then you're serializing. You're back to the serial bottleneck almost. It looks like the serial bottleneck. If all threads are waiting for a bank, except for one, then again, you're serializing. It's very similar to Amdahl's uh, ser serial bottleneck. But uh, many parallel programs cannot be parallelized completely. And as a result, you get all of these bottlenecks. And there are several causes of these serialized code sections that we will talk about, if time permits, today. One is sequential portions. This is the Amdahl's serial part. Uh, there are critical sections, lock, unlock. Right? There are barriers, as we've discussed. All of the threads are trying to reach a barrier. And some of them actually uh, reach early. Some of them reach late. And the last reaching thread determines the performance of the parallel program. And if the last reaching thread reaches that barrier significantly later than the previous last reaching thread, then you're running serially for a really long time. Right? And there are also limiter stages in, in pipeline programs. If, you're, if you have pipeline parallelism, remember, this, remember that we discussed this in the systolic arrays. You can pipeline your program such that you divide a loop iteration into multiple stages, pipeline stages. And uh, you can, each of the uh, loop iterations, let's say you have uh, a loop, and you divide into A, B, C. Each of these can be executed in a different processor. And instances of A, like A1, A2, A3, dot, 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 can be executed on one processor, processor 0. Instances of B, B1, B2, B3, dot, 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 can be executed on another processor. And C1, C2, dot, 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 can be executed on another processor. Right? This way, you're really parallelizing the loop iteration 
in a fine grain across different processors. Right? And why would you want to do that? Maybe this part of the loop is working on common data. So you want to keep it in the same processor such that you reuse the data. And maybe A and B are communicating very little to each other. That way, you can parallelize A and B nicely uh, within the loop iteration. So loop iteration is parallelized across different processors. And you maintain data locality for these different Porsches that are potentially working on different pieces of data. Make sense? But if you do this, now your limiter stage will be the stage that takes the longest. For example, if B takes significantly longer than A and C, this processor that's processing all of the Bs will be the bottleneck. When this processor is done, uh, it'll be these processors would have been done for a long time uh, a long time ago. We'll take a, we'll, we'll get to that if we if time permits. But all of these serialized code sections lead to a lot of waste. Basically, they reduce performance because you have processors that are just waiting. They limit scalability of applications, as I will show you. Scalability means uh, how many threads can you add to a program until performance saturates, until you don't gain any more performance by adding threads. And they waste energy also, because threads are twiddling their thumbs, right, doing nothing. Or processors are doing nothing. So one example from MySQL, this is actually an old example. This is a database, open source database. Uh, what this does is when, whenever you create a request, uh, this request opens some database tables that you're trying to search, for example. You're trying, you're trying to search for some rows. And it performs operations on those tables after it, it opens those tables. Now this part is parallel. Once you open the tables, once you get the locks for the rows that you're searching in the database, you can parallelize this across different queries. Now this access to open tables cache is actually a serial part of this program. And this is a critical section because before you open the, let's say, before you say, I want to search this row in the database, uh, before you do that, you need to ensure that nobody's writing to that row. Nobody has write permissions, right? You could do this in a fine grain or coarse grain. It doesn't matter, but you need some critical section to do that. And this becomes a bottleneck uh, when, you, when you actually process a request in this MySQL database. And this is some data that shows what happens to the performance of the MySQL database as you increase the chip area or number of cores and correspondingly add more threads. At one, the speed up is one. The speed up is normalized to a single core. As you keep adding processors or threads at the same time, your performance increases. And it peaks around 16 or 17, I believe. And you get 6x speed up. But then your speed up starts reducing. <coughs> well, there are many reasons why the speed up starts reducing. And the bottlenecks in the parallel portion is one of them. Right? This is one of them, basically. And also, you're, you run into ping ponging issues, as we've discussed. Right? Basically, here, if you keep adding more cores, now your uh, locks and shared data start traveling around those cores, and you get additional latencies. So your performance starts reducing, because you're not improving. You're not getting any benefit from adding more cores, but you're actually increasing the latencies in the system. So I'll show you uh, how we can actually achieve this kind of curve. And this kind of curve will be achieved by asymmetry. Actually, this is an old result. Uh, it, should, it should scale up even better with the, if, if we get to the latest uh, mechanisms that I will talk about. So this is today. If you do asymmetric designs, that's what you can get. So if you look at code sections, actually, you have different demands in different code sections. And that's what will motivate asymmetry in this case. What we really want is in a serialized code section, you really want a really one powerful large core. Whenever you uh, are on the critical path, it's a serial section. If all threads are waiting for it, or many threads are waiting for that section, you would like to execute that on a powerful large core such that you can get out of it quickly. In a parallel code section, Latency of that code is not very important. You can have many wimpy small cores, right? Because it's parallel by definition. And you can tolerate the latency of any single part of the program. So these two obviously conflict with each other, right? If you have a single powerful core, you're spending your area. You cannot have many small cores. A small core is, at, this, at, the, sa uh, at the same time, much more energy and area efficient than a large core, right? We'll, I'll show you some numbers with that. Well, I guess you, you already figured out where I'm going with this, basically. We're going to put mo both types of cores on the same chip, as people have started doing now. So what are these large versus small cores? Large cores could be out of order, white fetch, a lot of the things that we've discussed, deeper pipelines, aggressive branch predictors, multiple functional units, memory dependence speculation that we've discussed, load store handling, trace cache we didn't discuss, but we can discuss later if we take 742. Small cores are wimpy cores that we've also seen in order, narrow fetch, shallow pipeline, 
maybe no branch predictor with fine grained multi threading, right? Few functional units. So large cores are usually power inefficient. Uh, and this is a good rule of thumb, actually. As you uh, quadruple the area, you get 2x the performance. People have actually plotted this at Intel over, over cores. And area can be uh, proportional to power. And this is actually a paper from Intel in 2004. Uh, they looked at cores that look like this. Basically, you have a large core. Uh, it's wide. It's deep. Its normalized performance is this. Its normalized power is this. So it's a lot more power hungry. And its energy per instruction is a lot more than a small core. And small core is wimpy, as you can see. It's kind of like the core that you're de you've designed uh, uh, for, for ARM today. So let's take a look at, so people, uh, when, when multi-core uh, came about, when uh, industry started turning into multi-core, they've actually looked at, started with both ends. Some companies started with large cores, some companies started with small cores. And I think they're converging right now to asymmetric multi-cores. They figured out that neither of it is the best. So this is the large, this is actually one of the earliest multi-core chips from a major company, it's IBM Power 4. And this is a beautiful paper that describes the entire system microarchitecture of IBM Power 4. But if you look at this, it's symmetric multi-core. Uh, but it has fewer and more powerful cores. So basically, compared to some of the other things that we've seen in the earlier uh, figure. So it has two cores only. And uh, each core is pretty powerful. Basically, uh, it's, uh, it has out of order execution. It has a 100 entry instruction window, eight wide instruction fetch issue execute. It has a large hybrid branch predictor, just like the one you've designed. Large, relatively large L2 cache for its time. And it had aggressive, aggressive stream-based prefetching. And some of you actually did this as your uh, extra credit assignment uh, for the prefetcher. Some of you have to come up with good prefetcher designs. So, and then later, IBM actually made, it, uh, made, uh, made Power 4 multi-threaded. If you look at this, it's a multi-threaded Power 4. Uh, and they've uh, introduced Power 5. It's kind of similar. Uh, but basically, that was the path IBM took when they started uh, with multi-core build large cores. On the other hand, Sun, another company that actually started the multi-core early on, uh, took the exact opposite approach. Basically, they started with small cores. This is Sun Niagara we discussed earlier, uh, briefly, actually. But if you look at this, you have uh, eight cores over here. And you don't need to know all of this. Basically, you can uh, read this paper if you want to take a look at that. And each core is four-way fine-grained multi-threaded, six stages, dual issue in order. and it even has a shared floating point unit among cores to minimize costs, such that you can put more cores in it. Uh, and it doesn't have a branch predictor, because it's fine-grained multi-threaded, right? Uh, later, they figured out that they need to put a branch predictor to get good performance on serialized code sections. But basically, this is, the, this is what the core looks like. It's fine-grained multi-threaded. And well, if you take 742, we'll cover what, what came after this. But Sun actually moved towards making the cores bigger and bigger. And IBM moved towards making the cores kind of smaller and smaller, such that you, can get, you could put more cores on the chip. Because they both figured out that they're not at the best place between this trade-off. Because the demands are uh, not just for the large core, not just for the small cores. You really want a piece of both. And we've talked about this already. In a serialized code section, you want one powerful large core. In a parallel code section, you want many wimpy small cores. So the key question is, can we get the best of both worlds? So let's take a look at some of the assumptions. Uh, basically, let's take a look at the trade-off between performance and parallelism. Uh, let's assume that a small core takes an area budget of 1 and has performance of 1 unit. And large core takes an area budget of 4 and has performance of 2. These are kind of reasonable, at least at the small scale. Uh, the tile large approach that, that was taken by IBM or AMD or Intel, and it's still taken by a lot of these companies, uh, is tile a few large cores on the same chip area. This gets high performance on single threads at, at the serial code sections because you get two units of performance. Remember, large core uh, gets a performance of two. Uh, and assume an area budget of 16 here. If you have an area budget of 16, you can, have, you can put four large cores in it because we have assumed uh, a large core has, uh, uh, occupies an area of four. You get the performance of two in the serial code section and because only one large core will be running that. And all the other large cores will be waiting. But you get low throughput on parallel program portions, right? If everything is completely parallel, what you get is uh, eight units, right? OK? And we'll see that how it's calculated later. So if you actually, uh, well, well, why do you get eight units? Because a large core has a performance of two, so it can actually execute one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two uh, threads in parallel. So you get four times two threads in parallel. Uh, 
The other approach, tile small approach, basically you tile 16 small cores, just like Sun Niagara did. Well, in this case, we have an area budget of 16. That's why I show 16. Intel Larrabee did this also. Tyler tile, actually this is ultra small. This is even wimpier than Niagara's cores, if you look at the specification. Uh, the upside of this, the biggest upside of it, is you get high throughput on the parallel part. You get 16 threads running at the same time. But you get low performance on the serial part, on the single thread. You get one unit of performance, right? Because there is no better core to run that thread on. And you cannot get the best of both, both worlds if you do that. So this is a summary. Uh, if you do tile large, you get high performance on single threads, but low throughput on parallel portions. If you do tile small, you get high throughput on the parallel part, but low performance on the serial part. What is even worse is you, you get reduced single thread performance compared to existing single thread processors. So that's the problem with tile small. You really need to have an application that actually uh, scales to uh, the, this number of parallel cores. So you don't want to have a serial bottleneck. So if you want to get the best, best, best of both worlds, the idea is to have both large and small on the same chip. Right? The similar to the heterogeneity is always similar. Right? In the TLDRAM, tiered latency DRAM, for example, we wanted to have long bit lines and short bit lines at the same time on the same chip. That was a DRAM chip, but that's the same idea. Well, we're going to do the same thing over here. Have both large and small on the same chip. This way, you get performance asymmetry on the ch same chip. And that's the idea of asymmetric or heterogeneous multi-core. Basically, it looks like this. This is one example. And if you take 742, we cover a lot more examples. But this is the example of a statically heterogeneous chip. You devote some area to the large core, and you devote the remain, remaining area to the small cores. This doesn't always have to be the case. If you can build small cores such that you can merge them together, such that they can operate as a large core, this could be called a morphable core, if you will, then it's even better, right? You dynamically, it could be even better. You can dynamically turn these small cores into a large core whenever you need them. Of course, there could be overheads associated with this. Now you're partially reconfigurable, right? But if you take 742, you'll, you'll figure out, it will discuss a lot of those overheads. Because this may be better than that dynamic reconfigurable cores, because this is statically designed. You don't need to reconfigure anything at runtime. But it may, not, it may be worse also, because uh, you, you can always, you can only use this, well, you, can, you cannot use this as small cores. OK, that's the idea. So when you're in the serial part, you can use a large core. So you get two units of performance, which is the same as this. When you're in the parallel part, you can execute the parallel part on the small cores and the large core for high throughput. If you execute on the small cores, you get 12 units. And the large core gives you two more units. So you get 14 units. It's not as good as this one, unfortunately. So you lose a little bit of performance on the parallel part. But if you're smart, maybe you can design this as a multi-threaded core. Then you, you, you can go back to 16 units, right? Make sense? If, you can, if, you, if the large core is also multi-threaded and can execute four threads, you can get close to 16 units. OK? OK, so how do you accelerate serial bottlenecks? Once you have a substrate like this, it's really easy. When you have single thread, the large core executes it. So here, it's executed by the large core. When you actually launch new threads, they occupy the smaller cores. And when they're done, you're back to the single thread, and large core executes it. OK? That's the basic idea of accelerating uh, serial bottlenecks on the large core. It's pretty simple. So if you do these, uh, if you remember these assumptions, small, cores, uh, small core takes an area budget of 1, has a performance of 1. Large core takes an area budget of 4, has a performance of 2. If you evaluate these designs, this is what you will get. Tile large uh, has 4 large cores, uh, 0 small cores, serial performance 2, parallel throughput 8. Tile small, 0 large cores, 16 small cores, serial performance 1, parallel throughput 16. And this one, we've already talked about it, right? One large core, 12 small cores. Serial performance is 2, which is equivalent to this one. Parallel throughput is 14, which is equivalent to this one, kind of. <laughs> That's why you will need to actually design this to be multi-threaded uh, to do better, right? OK? That way, you can get the best of both worlds if you design this large core to be multi-threaded over here. OK. So that's how you can accelerate serial portions. But that's not the only serial, serialized part in a parallel program, right? You also have these overheads that you want cookies for just now. So how do you actually accelerate those parallel bottlenecks? Uh, and actually, let's talk about why do we, why do we want to do that. Uh, serialized or imbalanced execution in the parallel portion can also benefit from a large core, right? These things. If you have synchronization. If you have load imbalance, for example, 
you can figure out the thread that's slow, and you can ship that to the large core such that it's not slow anymore. Right? You could do something like that. That's the benefit of having asymmetry. Uh, some of the examples are critical sections that are contended. Right? If you have a critical section that's really contended, that's really serializing a lot of other threads, you can say, oh, let me ship this to the large core such that the large core can execute it quickly and get out of it quickly. Or parallel stages that take longer than others to execute. For example, here, if you know that, or if you somehow figure out that B takes twice as long to execute than A and C, you can allocate this to a large core and allocate A's to small cores. Right? That way you, get, you don't run into this load imbalance issue. Okay? So the idea is to dynamically identify these code portions somehow uh, that cause serialization and execute them on a large core. And I'll talk about one example of it, which is accelerated critical sections. And a lot of people are looking at doing something like this today. But let me uh, motivate the problem first. So assume you have a critical section. Critical section basically protects shared data, as we've discussed earlier. Uh, only one thread can be in that critical section. So you do lock and unlock. And if all threads are, uh, want to go into the critical section, only one thread can take the lock. Every other thread needs to wait for it. Uh, let's, uh, I'll pictorially demonstrate like 12 iterations. And I'll assume that 33% of instructions are inside the critical section in this iteration. If you execute this program, that synthetic program, with one processor, this is what you would get. Critical sections don't matter in this case because it's a single threaded version, right? But it spends 33% of its time in the critical section. It takes 12 time units. Let's say if you parallelize this and have two processors, this is what will happen. When one thread is in the critical section, the other thread cannot be. So they cannot both be in the critical section. So you get some performance, but it's not exactly 2x because you have this additional critical section that cannot be parallelized. So performance improves here. If you go to three threads, again, only one thread can be on the critical section. You improve performance because you can parallelize the parallel part, uh, well, fully parallel part. Uh, and uh, this is good. But if you go to four threads over here, now your performance doesn't improve anymore. Why? Because at any given point in time over here with three threads, there was one thread in the critical section. There's no way you can parallelize this program more unless you change the program, because you're really bottlenecked by your critical sections, right? And as you add more processors, what you're doing is only adding more waiting. These threads will be waiting for each other, and these are the wait, weights that you've added to your program. In fact, the performance would be worse here. This execution time will be higher over here, because now you're ping-ponging between more, more caches. These locks uh, and shared data that are inside the critical section are ping-ponging across more processors, you get more latency. So this is a critical section bottleneck program at this point. Now, let's assume we can accelerate critical sections by 2x. What will happen? If you do this, single thread performance will improve. That's good. But two thread performance will also improve. Now your critical sections are smaller. Three thread performance improves. And now the three thread version of the program is not bottlenecked by the critical sections. If you look at here, there is no thread that is executing a critical section at this point in time, right? Which means that, let me finish this and then I'll take your. Which means that if you add one more thread, now your performance improves, right? Because you're really parallelizing those parallel parts that are not part of the critical section. So what we've done this way is, now what we've done is we've improved performance by accelerating the critical section by 2x. We've also improved scalability. Before, three thread version of this program was the best version. But now you can actually have one more thread, four threads, and get even better performance. The number of threads at which performance saturates for this program increased. That's, the, that's what scalability is. Basically, accelerating critical sections increase performance and scalability. That's the takeaway from this cartoonish graph. Yes? That I was going to say, when, here you accelerated the critical sections for all of the threads, but not all of the cores got beefier. It was really only one. That's right. So I'll tell you how to do that. <laughs> okay? We're going to ship the critical sections to a single large core, and it's going to accelerate, and then it's going to return back the results to the threads that, are, that, that requested the shipping. OK. So uh, let's take a look at this impact of critical sections on scalability. Actually, I've already shown you this. But contention for critical sections leads to serial execution of threads in the parallel program portion. And this increases with the number of threads and limits scalability, because you, you're contending more if you have more threads. right? More threads are trying to access this lock. And this is what I've shown you with MySQL. Right? 
the, the reason this goes this way, this curve looks this way, you get less benefit is because of the contention for critical sections. And then you later introduce other overheads like bandwidth contention, resource contention, and also ping ponging. So today, that's what you get. So we'll, we'll look at a mechanism that buys you this kind of scalability curve, this kind of performance curve. And that's the idea of accelerated critical sections. So uh, why do we want to do this? Basically, execution time of these sequential kernels, critical sections, and limiter stages, limiter <coughs> stages like this, must be short. You could argue that, well, I don't care. <laughs> the programmer should have written their program better, right? And since you've taken this course, you know what to tell that person, right? <laughs> Well, it's always a trade-off. Yes, programmer would probably have done a better job if they had infinite time in the world. And if they were careful, if they were expert. That's true, but it's difficult. Uh, so if that's not the case, it's difficult for the programmer to shorten these critical sections. Because if they don't have infinite time in the world, they may not know the program very well. They may not know the bottlenecks really well. Right? There may be variation in hardware platforms also. Maybe they optimize for this platform. And something else becomes a bottleneck in some other pro platform. Right? So that's difficult to, because implementations of locking mechanisms is very different across different hardware platforms. If you punt on the programmer, you should, always, you should also try to help them somehow to understand what's different in different platforms such that they can write code that works on all pro platforms. And obviously, you have limited resources, limited programming time. Programmers uh, are not always experts. So the goal is to have a mechanism to shorten seal bonics without requiring much programming effort, or any programming effort, if possible. Right. If you do that, again, you're uh, helping the programmer. You're, 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 you're placing yourself at a different place in the programmer microarchitect curve. Now this is harder for the microarchitect. So we'll examine a solution that's harder for the architect or microarchitect, but that's easier for the programmer. And the idea is to accelerate serialized code sections by shipping them to powerful cores in an asymmetric multi-core processor. And that's the idea. Basically, hardware and software cooperatively shift critical sections to a large, powerful core in an asymmetric multi-core architecture. The benefit, you can reduce serialization due to contended locks. You can reduce the performance impact of hard to parallelize sections. The programmer now can say, oh, I don't know how to parallelize this without running into bugs. So let me make the critical section a little bit large. And I hope the hardware will accelerate it. So now you're making actually the programmer's life a lot easier. Uh, and the hope is that programmer doesn't need to heavily optimize the parallel code. They get fewer bugs. They get improved productivity. And maybe over generations, they parallelize their code and get, they get better performance. And over time, maybe you need less or less this asymmetry. But that's always an illusion also, because there will be some other bottlenecks that will require asymmetry, probably. OK, so how does this work? Uh, I'll give you a pictorial example, very simple, again. This is the critical section that we're uh, concerned about. You enter the critical section, and you're assuming uh, you're inserting something into a priority, shared priority queue. At the end, you'll leave the critical section. Uh, basically, we have one large core, three small cores. And this large core has a critical section request buffer. Well, this is automatically. This is a mind of its own. I don't like it when this has a uh, slideshow. There you go. OK. So you have a critical section request buffer that uh, is a FIFO queue in this case that uh, uh, buffers the request coming from the three cores. So you can have a three entry. Uh, let's assume that processor 2 encounters a critical section. And we are going to add a critical section call instruction. It basically sends a critical section call request to this critical section request buffer in processor 1 through the interconnect. And processor 1 executes the critical section when this becomes the oldest. In this case, it's the oldest. And after it executes, it sends a critical section down signal to processor 2. And processor 2 can now go on. And basically, if multiple processors send a critical section call request to processor 1, they get queued over here and serviced from the queue. Yes? So from the programmer's perspective, can I just call you know, pthread get locker? Whatever, mm -hmm. and the compiler will automatically convert that into instructions. That That's right, use. exactly. That's the hope, basically. If the programmer actually does this through through a library like pthread library, this is easy to do, even at the library level. Once you compile the library, they comp compile the critical section calls. But if the programmer doesn't use libraries, then it may be harder. Right. <laughs> so that, that's why if if the programmer uses libraries to do locking, this this is really easy on the programmer. Somebody can convert that those pthread calls to critical section calls. And basically, what, what we've done over here is this is the baseline. In the small core, you would execute uh, 
something, and then you, you do locking, and then you compute a result within the critical section, and then you do unlocking. What we're doing is we're basically converting these to something else underneath. The small core, this is, what the, uh, this is the code that needs to be executed on the small core. This is the code that needs to be executed on the symmetric multi-core. Basically, uh, uh, there's some input uh, to uh, the critical section that's computed by the small core. And uh, before, uh, you need to send that to the large core also. Right? Does that make sense? So if you look at this critical section, you're operating on this value that was computed over here. Somehow the large core needs to have access to it. Right? And we're going to use the stack to communicate between the small core and large core because the assumption is that this is a shared memory multiprocessor. Again. Basically, the small core uh, computes this value A, pushes that on the stack, and then starts a critical section call request uh, with lock x and a target program counter. Target program counter is the beginning of the critical section. And sends this request to the large core. And this gets queued in the large core's critical section request buffer. So it sends the uh, lock, it sends the target program counter, it sends the core ID, it, it sends a stack pointer. Because there needs to be a pointer where these cores need to communicate from. And large core, uh, once, once this becomes the oldest critical section call request, it basically executes uh, starts executing from the target PC. Target PC first acquires the lock. Uh, we can discuss why that, ne that is needed, because there will be cases where some, well, anyway, don't, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll take a look at it in a, in a little bit. It acquires the lock. It pops the value from the stack, so it gets A. It executes this code in the critical section. It pushes the result on the stack. It releases the lock, and then executes that critical section return. And that critical section return sends a critical section done response to the core ID that was sent. And when the small core receives the critical section done, it basically executes the remaining code, pops the result, and then prints the result. Make sense? Simple. So one issue with this is, and that's the reason why these are kind of needed, is you can get into false serialization. Right? Now let's take a look at what that is. Basically, that's, that's the problem of serializing independent critical sections. Because all of the critical sections go to this large core, right? But some critical sec not all critical sections are the same critical section. Some of them are protecting totally different things. But they still get serialized because they're in this critical section request buffer. So there could be solutions to this problem. And one solution, which I'll not go into a lot of detail of, is uh, uh, selective acceleration of critical sections. Basically, you keep track of whether you're actually falsely serializing these critical sections. Let's assume you have critical section A and critical section B. And you get a critical section call for A. And these are counters telling how many times uh, was this serialized falsely. This is not serialized falsely because you can execute it. So this gets reduced. Later, you get critical section call A again. This is correct serialization. You have to serialize critical section call A uh, to the same, uh, same, uh, same critical section. right? So that gets reduced again, saying, I'm not falsely serializing this critical section, so everything is good. But now if you get a critical section called B for, for a totally different critical section that has nothing to do with this lock, well, this has to wait for these critical sections to go first. right? This was not a problem before, because if two small cores are executing these critical section call A and B, they would execute them in parallel. But now there's a problem. We're serializing them. So this increases. And once this becomes greater than a threshold, then the large core says, OK, don't send me these Bs anymore, because I, I'm doing the wrong thing. OK? This is one way of fixing the problem. OK? And that's, why, that's exactly why you need to acquire the lock and release the lock, because sometimes there, there may be critical sections that are shipped and not shipped, and you, get, you can run into deadlock issues. So there, uh, it's not as simple as I described it to you. But the idea high level is very simple. But implementation, whenever you go to implementation, you need to look at all of these corner cases. So OK, what, what are the performance trade-offs? Basically, the pluses, uh, one big plus is faster critical section execution, hopefully, in the large core. Right? Because the large core is bigger, you can execute the critical sections faster. The other big upside of this is actually you get shared locks that stay in the same place. You get better lock locality. Because all of the locks, when you need them, it's really in the large cores cache. Right? And shared data also stays in large cores, hopefully large caches. And it makes sense to have a large cache for the large core. Uh, you get better shared data locality and less ping ponging. So you reduce some other overhead as well by executing all of the critical sections, all of the shared data, and sh uh, keeping all of the shared data and shared locks in one place. But there are obviously minuses. With every idea, you have minuses too. Uh, one minus is large core is dedicated for critical sections, right? or serialized code sections. Now you have reduced parallel throughput, as we've seen. If you multi-thread it, you get 
better things, but uh, if you multi-thread them, now you get, uh, let's say you have a multi-threaded engine, and you're executing multiple parallel critical sections together that can be executed in parallel. Now you're reducing the acceleration for each of the critical sections, right? Because they are sharing resources of the large core. Uh, there's control transfer overhead, critical section call and critical section done, because you need to send those signals. Uh, and the thread private data needs to be transferred to the large core. So you get worse private data locality. Right. What is the thread private data? Remember, if we go back, now this A needs to be transferred to the large core right, with this push and pop. Whereas before, if you executed uh, this on the small core only, A would be in the cache of the small core. That didn't need to be transferred. Now it turns out this is actually an easier problem to solve, uh, basically. This transfer, you can actually predict what data needs to be sent to the large core before you actually need to do it. And I'm not going to talk about that, but this is called data marshalling. It's kind of like distributed systems. So let, let me take a step back here. Uh, you, can, you can think of this, think of the large core as a server and small core as a client. Right? What we're doing is the small cores are clients of the large core saying, large core, please execute this function for me. And that function happens to be the critical section. Right? And there are some inputs to that function, which are basically input values of the function that you need to marshal to the large core. Those inputs are usually available. So if, this is like very, very much like a distributed systems programming problem, right? If you program distributed systems, uh, uh, have you ever done that with the remote procedure calls? This is really a remote procedure call that's happening on chip, right? Except it's invisible to the programmer. You're doing a remote procedure call with some inputs, and the procedure call is for the critical section. So these inputs are usually easier to predict, whereas it's very hard to predict uh, which shared data will be accessed with which, which thread or which core. Right? That's why this is less of a problem. And I'm happy to talk about that later. Uh, and 742 actually covers that a lot. So there are a bunch of performance trade-offs, which I'll briefly cover. You get fewer parallel threads in the parallel portion, but you accelerate the critical sections. Uh, it turns out accelerating critical sections offsets the loss in parallel throughput. Uh, and this is actually a less of a problem as you go forward. As the number of cores on chip increases, the fractional loss in parallel performance decreases. For example, what, what does this mean? Uh, if you have uh, an, a, an area uh, for 16 small cores, if you dedicate uh, four of those to a large core, the loss in parallel performance uh, is only 75%, uh, 25%, right? It's actually not exact 25%, but it's 12.5%. It's uh, because remember, you can execute uh, parallel threads on the large core as well. But if you actually have 64 cores, and if you dedicate four of those cores for the large core, now your parallel performance loss is even smaller. Right? You actually lose, uh, what do you lose? You, you still have 62 out of 64 of your parallel performance, parallel threads. So this, is, this becomes less of a problem, unless you increase the large core size. Uh, so you get the overhead of the critical section call and critical section done, because those need to be communicated. But you offset that with better lock locality. Well, what does this mean? Basically, if you have all symmetric cores, locks need to travel across. You're converting the locks to basically critical section call and critical section done signals. And it turns out uh, avoiding the ping-ponging of locks is better because you keep them at the uh, large core. And let's take a look at this last one. The uh, last one is you get more cache misses for private data because private data now needs to be transferred to the large core. And also, a result needs to be transferred to the small core. right? Uh, but you get uh, fewer misses for shared data, because shared data stays in the large core's cache. Let's take a look at why uh, this is the case. Well, well, not why this is the case, but why shared data may be larger than private data. Well, what do you guys think, first of all? How much, how much, shared, uh, how much of the data that a thread is actually touching is shared versus private? In a critical section. Well, we qualify it that way. <laughs> Probably mostly shared. Mostly shared. Critical section. Okay. That's what how it should be, right? <coughs> if if the programmer wrote the program really well, most of it should be shared because you shouldn't do much private data manipulation in the critical section, otherwise you're serializing things. Ideally, you would like to touch only shared data in the critical section, because that's what needs to be really protected. And that should be the case, and I will show you an example as to why that makes sense to be the case, but it actually turns out Many programmers write programs inefficiently, and there are some programs where private data in the critical section is larger than the shared data. That just shows that programmers are inefficient in writing critical sections. So but, uh, let's take a look at uh, 
this particular function. Basically, this is a task management queue. You create some problems and you insert them in this priority queue or heap. Basically, new, uh, the private data that's generated by the thread is these new subproblems. Assume that it's kind of a node. And then there's a shared data that has this priority heap. Once you're inserting it, you'll need to figure out where you actually insert it, right? Basically, the amount of private data that you touch is only one node. But the amount of shared data that you touch in this critical section, and this needs to be done in a critical section because multiple threads may need to be inserting uh, their own private data uh, to this shared uh, heap. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, if you look at the number of nodes that are touched that are shared, it's a lot more than the number of nodes that are touched that are not shared, that are private. Make sense? So this just shows that it makes sense that shared data is larger than the private data. And because of that reason, ACS actually improves performance. But uh, as, I, as I told you, uh, it's not always the case. Sometimes private data, you touch a lot of private data. But this problem can be solved because private data is easier to handle. You know before the critical section what private data needs to be shipped to the large core. And if, in fact, you know sometimes much earlier than that. Whereas you don't usually know what shared data you're going to touch because that's dependent on the structure of the shared data, which may have been modified by some other thread. Right? OK. So let's take a look at the performance of this, and then we're going to take a break. And in the meantime, you can get your cookies. Hopefully, you checked how many cookies you have. I'm going to check. <laughs> OK. Uh, so this is what we have, basically. I'm going to compare the performance of this to symmetric multi-core, very small cores, asymmetric multi-core that looks like this, except only serial parts are executed here. And ACS is accelerated critical sections. Uh, with this uh, critical section request buffer. Not only serial parts, but also critical sections are accelerated in the large core. And these are, we've developed a simulator just like the simulators that you've developed. And this has a MESI protocol also, that just like what you're designing. And we've tested a bunch of workloads, critical section intensive applications, data mining, sorting, database, web networking, dot, 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 games. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the simulator can actually simulate many, many cores, but it has stream prefetcher. And these are the cores. Large core is out of order, 128 entry reorder buffer, 4 wide, 12 stage. Small cores are wimpy. And there are some on chip interconnect latencies that are also modeled. And there are some, these are, this is the cache hierarchy. So if you look at this, uh, let's, let me give you the performance uh, comparison. We're assuming a chip area of 32 small cores. With the symmetric multi core, you have 32 small cores. With the asymmetric multi core, one large and 28 small cores. Uh, so you have two asymmetric multicores here. The, uh, this is the speed up over symmetric multicore. So 100 means that's the performance execution time, well, uh, inverse of execution time for the uh, symmetric multicore. The light blue one, or cyan one over here, I think it's light blue than cyan, but anyway, is what happens if you accelerate the serial bottleneck. Unfortunately, this is named as sequential kernels, but it's really the serial bottleneck. When you have only one thread, Amdahl's a serial bottleneck, you, uh, uh, you, you keep that in the large core. If you do that, you gain some performance. This is the average of the speed ups. You get about 7%, I believe, across a symmetric multi-core. So doing that by itself buys you a lot of performance. And if you look at the, some applications, like the QSort application here, for example, has a big serial portion because the programmer did not parallelize that program really well. There, was, there were some cases where only one thread exists. Now, if, you, if on top of that you accelerate critical sections, this is what you get. On average, your performance improvement compared to symmetric multi-core is about 41%. So you get about 32% more compared to accelerating only serial sections. So you get significant performance benefit by accelerating critical sections. And actually, you can now divide these wor workloads into two. Some of these have coarse grain locks. Some of these have fine grain locks. And the performance improvement here is much higher. Coarse grain locks mean, means uh, the programmer did not optimize the locks a lot. So the critical sections are large. And maybe there's a lot of private data in the critical sections that is being manipulated. Whereas if the programmer actually optimizes the program uh, more, reduce the size of the critical sections, the benefit you get is less, as expected, right? If the programmer actually really did a great job, maybe you don't get any benefit. But that's not even true. Because if the programmer uh, did a really good job. They reduced the size of the critical sections. Still executing the critical sections in the large core might be a good idea because now you avoid ping ponging, right? You keep shared data and shared locks in one place. But maybe it's less of a win. Maybe a good idea, but less of a win. And in fact, you see that here you don't get a lot of benefits uh, in spec JBB. So that one's. So one thing here, uh, I think, 
Well, I guess I've talked about this and that. One thing here is it's important to do these comparisons uh, at equal area, certainly. But also, whenever you're doing these comparisons, you should pick the number of threads as the best threads on that particular uh, system. So for example, you shouldn't, uh, if the program's performance is not the best with 32 threads, when you have 32 small cores, that should not be your performance comparison point. You should pick however many threads is the best. Now, this is kind of optimistic, because how does a programmer know what number of threads is the best on a particular platform? That's a, there, there you go. There's another problem for you to solve to help the programmer. In fact, programmer doesn't know. Whenever you write a parallel program, well, you need to test, first of all. But uh, the best number of threads may depend on your input set. So if you have some hardware substrate that automatically determines number of threads for a parallel program, that will aid the programmer much better. Uh, that, that will aid the programmer a lot. But for comparison purposes, we'd like to set, we'd like to assume that the programmer somehow knows somebody sets the best number of threads for a given system. So you're comparing here uh, best number of threads on the symmetric system for a given application, best number of threads on the symmetric system, best number of threads on the uh, on this system and best number of threads on this system. Right? And they could all be different. And they are different, as I show you over here. These are what I call the scalability curves, if you will. Uh, this is the same as what I showed you. In fact, where is this? Where is my curve? Oh, this is my curve. This is the MySQL OLTP, online transaction processing application. What I've shown you here was as you increase the number of threads or number of cores in terms of small core area, the performance you get. And I've shown you this, I believe, green one. The green one is symmetric multi-core, SCMP, symmetric chip multiprocessor. That's what you get. As you increase the number of cores, this is the curve you get. Performance speed up reduces after a while. In fact, if you run this at 32 threads, you're really comparing the performance in a terrible way. right? You're really running the system not at its maximum performance. So you should really be running this number of threads on SCMP. Now what happens is if you actually add ACS, accelerated critical sections, the performance speed up curve looks like this. So now you can be running at 32 threads. So your scalability has improved. And this is true for some other applications also. Let me take another poster child. I guess this is a good one. This is a puzzle benchmark. It's a game, actually. It's solving a puzzle. Uh, and the performance is actually horrible if you have symmetric multicores or ACMP where you accelerate only the serial sections. So serial sections are not a, uh, are not a big problem over here, but critical sections are. Uh, if you look at this, this is this green one, or the, if you follow the red one, what you get is performance saturates around like seven cores. Even with seven cores, you're getting 2x speed up. Not good. But if you actually accelerate critical sections, you keep getting higher and higher speed up because this is really bo a bottleneck by the critical sections. And you get almost 6x speed up with 32 uh, threads. Make sense? And OK. Basically, scalability improves for all of these benchmarks. The number of threads at which performance saturates improves for all of, the, all of these benchmarks. OK. So let me summarize, and then we can take a break. Basically, what I've shown you is critical sections reduce performance and limit scalability of parallel applications. The idea is, uh, to solve this is to accelerate critical sections by executing them on a powerful core. And these are the numbers that I tried to make up by looking at that slide. But basically, you can reduce average execution time of these applications that we've evaluated by 34% compared to an equal area symmetric multicore, and 23% compared to an equal area asymmetric multicore that just accelerates serial bottlenecks. And it improves scalability of seven of the 12 workloads. So I've given you this idea with critical sections, but it's important to generalize the idea because critical sections are not the only bottlenecks, as we've discussed. They're barriers. Uh, and there are also uh, these limiter stages. So how do you generalize the idea to general bottleneck acceleration? I'd like to talk about that next uh, after we talk about, uh, well, after we get the cookies, I guess. But any questions before we move on to the cookies? It's pretty interesting, isn't it? So I wish you, ha you had a way of doing this on arms big and little. That would be a great project for this course. That would be a great hands-on project. But unfortunately, I, uh, as far as I know, there's no way you can do that on arms big and little right now. They could do it themselves in their infrastructure. And I'm not sure if they're doing it underneath. But OK. So let's take a short break here, five minutes. Uh, and then we'll Let continue. me first summarize what I'll describe so that if, you're, if you have too much sugar from cookies, you can go to sleep after that. <laughs> 
but stay awake for this one slide. <laughs> so the problem is what we've discussed. Performance and scalability of multi-threaded applications are limited by these serializing synchronization bottlenecks. And these could be of different types. Critical sections we've discussed heavily. But they could be barriers or slow pipeline stages. And what I've not shown you is the importance or criticality of a bottleneck can actually change over time. And we're going to try to fix that here. The bottleneck can quickly change over time. And I'll show you some data with that. So our goal in this work, uh, which I think is really important going forward, is to dynamically identify the most important bottlenecks and accelerate them. Because ideally, you would like to identify the most important thing that's limiting your performance. And I think that's a general principle in designing systems. Whenever you design a system, you'd like to first identify the most important bottleneck, fix it, and then go into the next most important bottleneck, fix it. That way, you can improve the systems much better. So there are two cute questions over here. How do you identify the most critical bottlenecks? We'll talk a lot about that. And how do you efficiently accelerate them? Well, we kind of talked about that, right? Heterogeneous multi-core. You ship the bottlenecks to the large core. Uh, the solution that I'll describe is bottleneck identification and scheduling. It's a hardware software cooperative solution. I don't believe these things can be sold purely in hardware and software, or purely in software, actually. The best solutions will likely need to be hardware software cooperative. And hopefully, with this class, we're preparing you for that kind of solutions. Future is mostly like that going forward. There are no more easy, low-hanging fruits that you can do at one level that will solve these, at least the, this kind of problems. So software annotates the bottlenecks somehow uh, with bottleneck call, bottleneck return instructions, and implements waiting for bottlenecks with a special instruction called bottleneck wait. If you used mWait at Intel, this is a glorified version of mWait, if you will. If you haven't used, don't worry. So the hardware identifies these bottlenecks that are, that are causing the most thread waiting. So this is difficult to do in software. Hardware identifies the ones that are the most important bottlenecks and accelerates those bottlenecks on large cores of an asymmetric multi-core system. And we'll see how the hardware software communication is done. So it turns out this improves multi-thread application performance and scalability, outperforms some of these previous things that we talked about, outperforms accelerated critical sections by a large amount, actually. And performance actually improves with more cores. So let's take a look at these bottlenecks. Now you can go to sleep. That's one <laughs> thing. But I think you would like to see how this is done. Right? So the definition of a bottleneck is any code segment for which threads contend or wait for. There are several examples. One is MDAL serial portions we've discussed. There is only one thread that exists in this case. Obviously, that's on the critical path. Once you reduce the length of this, you're improving the performance of the program. And this is the critical path of the program, uh, not the critical path of the hardware. Critical sections, we've talked about, they ensure mutual exclusion. And they're likely to be on the critical path if they're contended, because other threads would be waiting for them. But they may not be. right? Even if they're contended, there, must be, there may be a lot of work, because you have some load imbalance in the system. As a result, that may not be on the critical path. Barriers ensure all threads reach a point before continuing. The latest arriving thread is on the critical path. There are also pipeline stages. Different stages of a loop iteration may execute on different threads. Slowest stage makes other stages wait. It's on the critical path. So one observation that we haven't made before is these limiting bottlenecks actually change a lot, very, very frequently over time in a real program execution. Let's, let me give you a cooked up program example to exercise that. And actually, whenever you cook up an example, there will be some programmer in the world that has a similar example in real programs, because their software is so varied in today's world that cooking up an example is good. <laughs> so we cooked up this example. We have two linked lists, A and B. Initially, A starts as a full linked list. B is empty. So what we do is we have multiple threads executing this code. And you repeat. Basically, the thread first locks uh, the full linked list traverse and randomly picks a node, and removes that node from that list, unlocks the list. This is one critical section. And then does some computation on that node, and then inserts that node into the empty link list, list, link list B. So you can think of this as some useless program, right? But actually, there are programs that do this kind of thing. And then to insert this, basically, you need to lock the empty link list. You, tra you traverse uh, based on some thing that I don't describe. Uh, and you insert into B, and then you unlock it. Until A is empty, you repeat this. Right? And each thread does this. There are two critical sections. And let's take a look at the execution profile of this with 32 threads. This is time in terms of millions of cycles. You can see that it's very fine grained, 0 through 14 million cycles. Is this even mon one millisecond today? Probably not, right? <laughs> yeah, that's not even one millisecond today. And this is a contention, number of threads that are waiting for either of these locks. The blue one is this lock. The red one is this lock. Uh, 
Initially, because this is full, A is full, lots of threads are waiting for A, right? Because you're re removing something, and lots of threads are trying to remove. And because B is empty, whenever you're trying to insert it, well, it's easy to insert. That's a short critical section, right? But over time, uh, this linked list becomes smaller. As a result, number of waiters at any given time reduces, right? Because the critical section becomes faster to execute for any given threat. <laughs> Whereas at this point, lock B becomes the limiter. So here, lock A is the limiter, really. Here, lock B is the limiter because a lot of threads are waiting for it. And eventually, all of the threads finish because this is a short program. You could actually increase the input set size, increase the size of the linked list, start with different balances over here, change the computation, and you'll get a very different profile. But it looks kind of like this uh, if, you, if you start with full and empty on A and B. Okay? So this shows that you actually limiting bottlenecks change quickly. And at this point, it's not clear. Maybe you, you excite both of them, right? Because they're both causing a lot of waiting. And this actually happens in real applications also. This is a real, again, MySQL running some sysbench queries with 16 threads. And this is time over here. This is contention, number of threads that are waiting for this lock open, lock lock. Open is the uh, function that I showed you. Uh, basically, you're opening these tables such that you can process on them later. Log is basically, this is the database log. Whenever you write, you're logging your writes. And if you look at this, there are some cases where the log lock is the bottleneck. There are lots of threads waiting for it. And there are some cases where lock open is the bottleneck. And this changes at a very, very fine grain. It's like on the order of millions of cycles. So because this is very fine grained, soft, having software to adapt to this is very difficult. Right? You can still look at coarse grain intervals, but if you can adapt it with a very fine grain at the hardware level, if you can find out what is the limiting bottleneck at the hardware level and ship that to a large core at the hardware level with very low overhead, you can get much better performance. In fact, accelerated critical section, if you think about it a little bit, you can actually program uh, the system such that the software does accelerated critical sections, but it'll lead to a lot of overhead because you, you're basically context switching uh, and sh doing migration of threads to the large core. Except threads are not executing long enough to am amortize the overheads of that migration, right, if you do it in software. So this requires a hardware solution, basically. Let me briefly talk about this also, but we've talked about accelerated critical sections, but there's also something called feedback-directed pipelining that I would like you to take away. Uh, the idea with feedback-directed pipelining is if you actually look at this, uh, look at these uh, threads, over, uh, this is a software library. And basically, software over time looks at which threads, what is the throughput of these Bs, As, and Cs on their engines? How many Bs are, are you completing per cycle? How many As are you completing per cycle? How many Cs are you completing per cycle over a coarse grain interval? And if the throughput of Bs is smaller than Cs and As significantly, you ship that to a large core such that you could improve the throughput. Make sense? That's the idea. So it's a software-based library, which works, but uh, we'll compare to that also. So basically, none of these works except critical. Uh, well, these are what we've discussed. It's a symmetric multi-core and this accelerated critical sections. None of these works can accelerate all types of bottlenecks, or they can. Ad uh, none of these can adapt to fine-grained changes in the importance of bottlenecks. For example, accelerated critical sections I just described to you. It doesn't consider the importance of a critical section, right? It just says, whenever I see a critical section, let me ship it to the large core. Maybe that critical section is not even on the critical path, right? So it may not be a good idea. So our goal is to have a general mechanism to identify and accelerate performance limiting bottlenecks of any type. Well, any type may be too strong, but at least these types that we've discussed. So the key idea is actually uh, thread weighting reduces parallelism and is likely to reduce performance, as I've shown you. Uh, code causing the most thread weighting is likely on the critical path. So once you have this insight, you can develop an idea. Basically, somehow figure out how many threads are waiting. How much thread weighting does this bottleneck cause? Basically, dynamically identify bottlenecks that cause the most thread weighting. And I'll show you how we can do that. Basically, whenever a thread is waiting for a bottleneck, you increment a counter for that bottleneck, saying, oh, I'm causing this many threads to wait for this many cycles. And if that number is very high, that means that this bottleneck it could be a lock. It could be a critical section. Well, it could be uh, a barrier. It could be a limiter stage. It doesn't matter. That is important. And you should ship that code to a large core to get out of it quickly. And accelerate that. That's, so that's the key idea. It's pretty simple. right? Then after this, it's the mechanics. How do you actually implement this? Uh, basically, I'll, I'll tell you a software hardware cooperative solution, as I said. And compiler, library, 
and hopefully not the programmer, does this. They annotate the bottleneck code. They basically say, these are the bottlenecks, potential bottlenecks. And they implement waiting for bottlenecks. And I'll show you how to do that. And they eventually generate a binary containing these bottleneck instructions that I'll show you. The hardware uh, measures the thread waiting cycles for each bottleneck, because you know hardware now knows which, where, where does the bottleneck start, where does the bottleneck end, and who's waiting for that bottleneck. Uh, how many things are waiting for that bottleneck. So it can measure the thread waiting cycles for each bottleneck. And it can accelerate bottlenecks with the highest thread waiting cycles. When it reaches a bottleneck, it checks, oh, has this bottleneck caused a lot of thread waiting cycles? If it has, let me execute on the large core. OK? Let's take a look at this support first. So first, you need to somehow annotate these bottleneck codes. And if the program is programming with libraries, again, this is easy. But if the program is not programming with libraries, that may be hard. So this is one example of a critical section. I'll cover the critical sections in a little bit more detail, uh, because otherwise we'll run out of time. Well, we do have time still. Uh, this is an example of a critical section. This is the critical section itself. You acquire the lock, release the lock. And this is the waiting. Right? While you cannot acquire the lock, you have some waiting mechanism. Right? So we're going to outline this. This, is, this could be in your function. We're going to outline this, create a separate function, target PC. And we're going to surround it with a bottleneck call. We're going to assign a bottleneck ID to it, such that the hardware can know what bottleneck is this. Right? And this is the target PC. And once the bottleneck is executed, you execute the bottleneck return, saying that I'm done with this bottleneck. So basically, we're delineating these bottleneck and marking all of these bottlenecks with a unique number in an entire program. OK? So bottleneck call and bottleneck return. Uh, and and one, thing, one other thing we're uh, going to say, uh, bottleneck call and bottleneck return are to delineate the bottlenecks, right? Uh, and we'll see how they're used. So one, thing, one other thing we're going to do is we need to keep track of how much waiting this bottleneck causes, right? If actually mm, it's done this way, it may be difficult for the hardware. So wh what happens today is you watch an address. You check for an address. If that address is modified, you say, oh, I should stop waiting and check the lock. Right? That's usually what happens in synchronization today. And that address is shared across different processors. And once the processor is out of bottleneck, uh, they set that address such that everybody who's watching for that address can wake up and retry to access the uh, uh, critical section. So we're going to replace that with a new instruction. And actually, this is very similar to Intel's mWait instruction, except they don't use it in this process with the semantics. <laughs> and the instruction is bottleneck wait. Basically, if you cannot acquire the lock, that means that you're waiting for the bottleneck with BID, and you still watch that address. Right? And every cycle you wait, it means that you're really waiting for this bottleneck. Bottleneck IDs, uh, the bottleneck BIDs, uh, count of uh, number of wait, uh, waiting cycles grows. And I'll give you an example of this. So this is used to keep track of waiting cycles. And these are used to enable acceleration. Okay. So you could do this for the barriers. Well, I guess I'll briefly uh, walk you through it, basically. This is, uh, uh, this is what happens. Uh, this is the code running for the barrier. And the thread finishes this. It returns uh, to, uh, after this. Uh, so basically, this is, uh, this is the parallel part of the program, if you will. And once the thread finishes the parallel part of the program, it goes back over here. It enters the barrier. And while not all threads are in the barrier, it waits. Right, this is the waiting cycles. You're waiting for this bottleneck over here, which is the barrier itself. And once waiting is done, once all threads are in the barrier, you exit the barrier and you do something. Right? That's, how, that's how a barrier code usually looks like. So you could actually do this with a bottleneck call and a bottleneck return. Just, uh, that looks just like this. Right? And this is how you account for, the, uh, account for how much waiting this bottleneck causes. And this is actually a pipeline stage. Pipeline stage looks kind of like this, basically. You, while not done, so this is one stage itself. What happens is uh, it actually gets inputs here. So you can think of it this way. Uh, uh, so uh, if you have work to be done here, uh, you dequeue the work, you do the work, and then you have an output queue. If you look at a pipeline stage, it usually looks like this. right? So you're executing this B's, and you have an output queue, and you have an input queue. You basically check whether you have a task in the input queue. If you don't have a task, that means you cannot ex execute Bs. Maybe they're done. Or maybe somebody else is not producing results for B. right? Because if you think of it, uh, you can connect these. Like A produces some values for B, produces values some, for, some C, for some C. Right? 
if you don't, uh, and you can communicate via queues, software queues between A, B, and C. If there's nothing in the input queue, that means that A hasn't produced any result. So B needs to wait. So B is waiting for the previous bottleneck ID, which is A. If B has produced something and the output queue is full, if the output queue is full because you've done the work, and if, you, if your output queue is full, then the next bottleneck is not making much progress, right? It is slow. That's the idea. So you're accounting for waiting cycles for the previous bottleneck and next bottleneck, depending on whether you have an empty queue or full queue, uh, empty queue in, in the input and full queue in the output. So you can do this. Well, I, I, I spent more time than I intended to, but hopefully that gives you an idea of how these uh, different bottlenecks get implemented in real systems. OK, so now that we've annotated these bottlenecks, how do we actually, uh, how does the hardware work? How does the hardware keep track of uh, how, many, uh, how much waiting this bo each bottleneck causes? And how does it accelerate uh, applications, uh, accelerate these bottlenecks? Let's take a look at that. The overview, first of all, uh, these are actually about identification and acceleration of the bottlenecks are independent tasks. I've given you some mechanisms for identification. Acceleration could be done in many, many ways. You can increase core frequency and voltage, for example. Right? That's another way of actually asymmetry, except you don't change the architecture that much. Basically, uh, if, a, if a thread, uh, you, have, you, may have, you may have all symmetric cores. And if a thread runs into a critical section that has caused a lot of waiting, you increase the frequency right, a lot. That could hopefully improve the performance, but it's not as good as perhaps a large core. Right? Because if you increase the frequency, you're not reducing tolerating memory latency very well. Because increasing the frequency reduces your computation time, but it doesn't help with the memory, right? unless you increase the memory frequency somehow. But that's, that's tough. Uh, or you could prioritize the. A, a bottleneck that's causing mo the most waiting is shared resource. We briefly talked about that, right? If you actually have a multi-threaded program, and if you know which uh, thread is causing uh, is on the critical path, you can accelerate that in the memory scheduler, right? Or you could migrate uh, the bottleneck to faster cores in an asymmetric multi-core. So we'll take a look at that. But let's take a look at how do you measure thread waiting cycles. Let's uh, go into a little bit more detail. Let's say you have two small cores, one large core. You need some bottleneck table to actually do this measurement. So we're going to add this bottleneck table. And let's say a uh, small core uh, executes an instruction uh, bottleneck waits. Uh, it's waiting for a bottleneck. And the bottleneck ID is 4,500. This gets inserted into the bottleneck table. The bottleneck table records bottleneck ID. And it says number of waiters is 1. And thread waiting cycles is so far 0, because no thread has waited for this bottleneck before. Now cycles continue. So thread waiting cycles get incremented, because the small core keeps waiting. So you keep incrementing this. And later, let's say small core 2 is, starts also waiting for this bottleneck. This gets sent to this bottleneck table. Now the number of waiters becomes 2. And you keep incrementing thread waiting cycles by the number of waiters every cycle. Now it, it gets incremented by 2. Okay. Later, let's say small core stops waiting for the bottleneck. Oh. It sends a signal to the bottleneck table saying, saying oh, I'm not waiting for the bottleneck anymore. Right? Now the number of waiters becomes 1. You keep incrementing this by 1, because this is still waiting for the bottleneck. And later, let's say small core 1 gets the bottleneck, uh, somehow stops waiting for the bottleneck, because it get, acquires it. It sends a signal to the bottleneck table saying, uh, saying that I'm not waiting for it. And the number of waiters becomes 0. And now you have a thread waiting cycles over here. That's how you can keep track of the thread waiting cycles per bottleneck. right? And as architects, you can add this kind of stuff into the system. So let's take a look at how do you accelerate bottlenecks with the highest thread waiting cycles. Now that you, let's assume that you have two bottlenecks here with different number of thread waiting cycles. You record it over time. Uh, this is bottleneck 4600, this is bottleneck 4700. Let's say small core 1 goes to uh, uh, execute a bottleneck call to 4600. It basically asks the bottleneck table, bottleneck table, I want to execute uh, the bottleneck at 4600. Tell me where I should execute it. The bottleneck table takes the bottleneck ID, figures out the thread waiting cycle that it has recorded, and compares it to a threshold. And in this case, thread waiting cycle is 100. Let's assume your threshold is 1,000. Thread waiting cycle is less than a threshold, which means that the bottleneck is not that critical. It's not that important. It doesn't cause a lot of thread waiting cycles. So the bottleneck table says uh, to small core, small core, execute this locally, because your bottleneck is not really important. It's not going to cause waiting based on my prediction in the past. So based on the amount of waiting it has caused so far, I'm predicting that it's not going to cause a lot of waiting in the future. OK? That's simple. Let's say small core later wants to execute bottleneck call 4700. Again, it asks the bottleneck table, 
Should I execute locally or remotely? <laughs> bottleneck table checks if the thread waiting cycles for that bottleneck is greater than a threshold. And in this case, it is. So the bottleneck table says, small core executes the bottleneck remotely. And now the small core prepares for remote execution. And what you need to do in the large core is similar to what we did for ACS, accelerated critical sections. Basically, it sends the bottleneck ID, program counter, stack pointer, and core ID to the large core, just like we did for accelerated critical sections. And this gets queued in the scheduling buffer. And scheduling buffer is not a FIFO queue anymore, because remember, we would like to accelerate the most important bottleneck first. So it's really a queue that's ordered based on the importance of the bottleneck, based on the thread waiting cycles. So it actually needs to send the thread waiting cycles also, but it's not written here. Does that make sense? So it's really an out of order queue or a priority queue. And uh, when, when this becomes the most important bottleneck in the large core, large core takes it from the scheduling buffer and executes starting from the program counter, uses the stack pointer, et cetera, just like accelerated critical sections. Make sense? It's kind of beautiful. And later, it executes the bottleneck return instruction. And once it executes the bottleneck return instruction while executing the bottleneck, it sends a signal to the small core saying, I'm done with your bottleneck. You can keep going with whatever you were doing before. Okay? And they communicate through the stack, so all of the values are uh, consistent or uh, across the memory. So of course, what you can say, uh, what you can say is that you have this global bottleneck table in the middle. You have a 1,000 core multi-core system. Are you going to always access this bottleneck table and ask whether you should execute, the, uh, execute this particular bottleneck remotely or locally? Yes, that's, a, that's an overhead. So what you can do is you can actually have uh, cache this bottleneck table. So a lot of the solutions to the latency is caching, right? So it's very fundamental, latency times. So the problem is, whenever you get a bottleneck call instruction, you need to access this bottleneck table. And bottleneck table can be located somewhere far away, right? So you uh, take that latency hit just to figure out whether you should execute locally or remotely. We don't want that latency hit. So if you somehow cache portions of this bottleneck table inside the local course, then we can quickly make the decision of whether we should execute remotely or locally, right? Maybe these are not very up to date. Maybe they're stale, but the, it, still, it still could be OK. So basically, periodically, the bottleneck table sends signals updating these acceleration index tables, which basically s store which bottlenecks should be accelerated where. And when you get a bottleneck ID over here, you check the acceleration index table. If you get a hit, that means that you should execute it remotely. If you get a miss, that means that you should execute it locally. But then you can still send a signal asking whether you've done the right thing. OK? So I think. Uh, I'll, I'll cover some of these. But actually, to get this to work, you need to deal with false serialization again. Because again, you can potentially, if the, if the multiple cores are executing different bottlenecks, then you're really serializing them by sending the bottlenecks to the large core. You don't want that, so you'd like to deal with source serialization. And I'm not going to talk about these, but there are other issues that you need to deal with to make it work. So what's the hardware cost of all this? It's actually not that much. Because you need a bottleneck table that looks like this. Uh, you need scheduling buffers. And you need acceleration index tables. And the overall hardware cost, uh, well, overall hardware should be off the critical path. Uh, and total storage cost for 56 small cores, two large cores, less than 19 kilobytes. More than the storage cost, how you design it is important. So what are the trade-offs here? You get faster bottleneck execution versus fewer parallel threads. It's very similar to ACS. You get better shared data locality versus worse private data locality. And we've talked about that again. You get the benefit of acceleration versus migration latency. This is very similar to CS call, CS done, right? Uh, versus the benefit of acceleration. But uh, let me go over this very quickly. Let me give you some results uh, of why uh, this makes sense to do. And then we're going to distribute the exams later on. If you haven't, well, you haven't picked them up yet. OK, so these are, again, very similar to what we've discussed earlier. Uh, we have a bunch of different workloads, eight critical section intensive, two barrier intensive, and two pipeline parallel applications that look like this. Again, a cycle level multi core simulator. Uh, and I'll continue. Basically, these are the comparison points. You've already seen symmetric multi-core, asymmetric multi-core. That's the baseline. Accelerated critical sections. And FTP is the software library that I discussed. It accelerates the slowest or lowest throughput pipeline stages. It's applicable only to pipeline parallel workloads. It's applicable to multi-thread workloads. So if you look at this, uh, these are workloads on the x-axis. Again, speed up normalized to ACMP, asymmetric multi-core on the y-axis. This is the ACS's performance benefits, what we've seen before. It's a little bit lower in this case because the workloads have improved over time. So it's about, I think, 15% or so. 
This is the performance benefit of BIS, bottleneck identification and scheduling. So you get significant performance benefit on top of ACS. And this is with, again, uh, 32 uh, small core equivalent area. Does that make sense? So you get performance benefit, basically. And before, uh, you could only apply ACS over here and FTP over here, but you could, you could apply this general bottleneck acceleration mechanism to uh, all of the workloads. And there, this is the, there are reasons why performance improves. Some benchmark limiting bottlenecks change over time, and criticality or importance of the bottlenecks change over time. So this can adapt to them better. Some benchmarks have barriers which ACS cannot accelerate. So that's the takeaway. And scalability also improves on four of the workloads. But let's take a look at why this works, actually. This is another uh, interesting thing. Uh, why this works, meaning what fraction of the time are you really accelerating the most important bottleneck, the critical path? So this is a fraction of execution time spent on predicted important bottlenecks. For, for example, ACS slash FTP. Let's take a look at the ACS case. This is the execution time, fraction of execution time that the large core is executing something, which means that fraction of execution time where you are in the critical section. At least some thread is in the critical section. Right? So it's about 45% on average across all of these workloads. This, this is the fraction of execution time where the large core is executing something. So 80%, or almost 70%. Is that 80 or 70? Well, 80, I guess, right? 80% of the time, large core is executing something, which means that 80% of the time, you're executing something that you think is important. But is it really important? So this is uh, the green portions of each bar tells you these are, whenever you're executing something on the large core, you're really executing the thing that's on the critical path, which is very low for ACS. If you look at this, it's about. I cannot tell here, 39%, yes. So 39% of the time, you're executing your critical path on the large core. With this, it's about 59% of the time. So think, think another way. 59% of your time, of, of the critical path execution time, you're able to reduce by executing the large core. But there's still 41% that you're not executing on the large core. So this is not good enough. Ideally, you would like to always execute your critical path in the large core, perhaps, right? Assuming you don't have a lot of overheads on everything. But this is not achieving the best possible. It's better than previous scheme that I described, but it's not the best. So, well, we're not talking about accuracy. So you, you're also accurate, but there, there are something. Uh, actually, let me talk about accuracy also. Sometimes you're executing something you think is critical on the large core, but it's not really critical, right? This red part over here. The critical part is really this one. That's on the critical path. This part is not critical. So you're, you're kind of mispredicting, right? And this says that maybe thread waiting cycle is not the best metric. Maybe you can have a better metric that says, oh, this thread is actually on the critical path. Because thread waiting cycle is a predictor, right? You keep track of how many, how many cycles, uh, uh, how many uh, thread waiting cycles this particular bottleneck has caused. And based on that, you're saying later it's going to cause thread waiting. But maybe that's not true, right? At that point, it's not going to be a bottleneck anymore. Maybe you should have a better predictor. Yes? It seems like a really interesting thing that we could potentially see here is with how often the, uh, there is a critical thread waiting for a non-critical thread to complete mm -hmm. on the big core. Mm -hmm. um, because that seems like That's right. you know, we mm -hmm. want all of the, or as much of the critical threads as possible to be executing on the big core. That's right. And also, you want other things to be able to run on the big core if it's mm -hmm. not doing anything, but not if it's preventing the critical things. That's right. So mm -hmm. I wonder uh, what. So we don't have that data here, obviously, but you can kind of tell maybe while these are on the uh, while these are on the critical core, so, uh, some other critical threads are on the critical core. Right. Uh, well, not uh, not the critical core, big core, uh, and you're delaying those critical threads. I guess so you cannot kind of. From here, we're not sure if the green section is waiting on the red section, that's right. or mm -hmm. if the red section mm -hmm. is working when the green section. Is that's right. Working. Exactly. Yeah. Those create two very different. That's right. This just tells you what fraction of the critical path you're covering on the large core, and what fraction of time you're executing something on the large core. OK, I'm going to skip these. But basically, the takeaway is as you add more small cores, the performance benefit you get increases. Because as you add more small cores, you get more contention, because the bottlenecks become more important. More threads are contending. That's the, that's the scalability problem as you scale the system up. You get more uh, serialization in the system. And as you add more large cores, this is actually good also. Performance improves, uh, because now we can accelerate independent bottlenecks. False serialization becomes less of a problem. So ideally, you would like to uh, have more large cores. 
But again, the performance improvement drops a little bit. If you have more uh, large cores, uh, you don't get as much benefit as you add more, uh, keep adding more large cores. OK, so I guess let me summarize quickly. But we talked about serializing bottlenecks of different types. They limit performance of uh, multi-thread applications. And their importance changes over time, as I've shown you. This is a hardware software cooperative solution, bottleneck identification and scheduling. It dynamically identifies bottlenecks that cause the most thread weighting and accelerates them on large cores of an ACMP. It's applicable to critical sections, barriers, and pipeline stages. And it improves application performance and scalability, and performance benefits increase with more cores. So this provides comprehensive, fine-grained bottleneck acceleration with no programmer effort, assuming programmer programs with libraries, right? assuming you can demarcate these bottleneck calls, bottleneck returns, and bottleneck weights. And if you program everything with libraries, you can do that. If you don't program with libraries, if you write your own synchronization primitives, well, somebody needs to figure that out. And compilers are usually not great at figuring out what are synchronization primitives that the programmer intended and what are not. So they become conservative. But if you do that, this is very fine-grained acceleration of bottlenecks. It's because this is very hard to do in software. You need to have the hardware support to do this. Well, I guess that's all. I should stop here. So this is not yet implemented in processors. But going forward, this kind of fine-grained acceleration methods will be important as you have uh, a large number of heterogeneous cores in the system. You can think of this doing, uh, with GPUs and CPUs, right? If you have a CPU and GPU, if you can somehow find the pieces of code that would run very well on a GPU dynamically, you could do that. Actually, in fact, uh, in one of my previous classes, one group examined the idea of if, if the GPU is executing some code that has a synchronization bottleneck, ship it to the CPU such that you can get out of it quickly. And they've saw, they found some good results from that. So a lot of these ideas uh, can be applicable in some way to heterogeneous systems. And going forward, that fine grain will be important. Any questions? Yes? In the space of having multiple big cores uh, so that you can take your uh, critical <coughs> sections that are you know, so like waiting on uh, lock A and waiting on lock B on two separate cores, mm -hmm. is there research uh, that suggests you know, how you might want to map different critical sections to different cores that oh. were, uh, in real time determine which ones you want to map to. Which I ones. see. Yeah, I haven't seen that. But you could, for example, statically partition based on lock address. Sure. That's one way of doing it. And that preserves the locality within a critical section. But you can perhaps do better. You can say these critical sections actually share some data, potentially. Right. And then you can map them together. But I haven't seen anything related to that. Yeah. Like well, we can talk about it. <laughs> OK. Do you want your exams back? OK, let's do that. <laughs> Rachada, maybe we can paralyze this.